Hello, and welcome to Arts and Entertainment. With Chris and Randall. I'm Chris. I'm Randall. And welcome to the show. Uh, This is part three (laughs) of the four part we're doing on uh, the fine arts. We haven't really done that many episodes on painting, Randall, have we? Well, we did a Marcel Duchamp episode. Um, I think we did one other on something, yeah. I forget. Yeah, n- it's, if you go to 90. our website, if you go to our website, chrisandrandall.com, you can click on Fine Arts and see everything under that subject. Yeah, but definitely out of 90, we really haven't done that many. So folks, what we're trying to do, and I know it's a lot of episodes, but the idea behind it is we just wanted to dedicate an entire timeline. And instead of doing a little bit as a survey, we just wanted to dig deep, and we really just haven't done a lot of painting. So this is I now where I think the first two episodes, we were just laying a lot of groundwork. The This episode and the final episode are going to be where we get very specific about certain people. And Randall is going to start really going into greater depth about, I guess, your thesis. But before uh, we get too far into the woods, uh, or too far into the weeds. Uh, I just like to say, as always, please like, subscribe, share, comment. Uh, we really need to know, especially when we decide we're going to do four episodes in a row on a subject where it's a truly the deepest dive I think we've ever done, Randall. You know, are we going in the direction you like? Is there, <laughs> would you like to see more of this kind of in depth analysis? Would you prefer shorter stuff? You know, we're, we're tailors and, uh, we just want to make a podcast that suits your interest. Randall, what's a great way to reach out to us? Well, check out our website, chrisandrandall.com. Various ways to reach us there. Our Facebook uh, page for the show is uh, people post there. I mean, it's uh, Arts and Entertainment with Chris and Randall. Check it out on Facebook. Cool. Well, as I used to say on the TV shows previously on Chris and Randall, <laughs> Arts and Entertainment with Chris and Randall, where were we covering, Randall? Well, yeah, I'll just do a a real quick recap. So I wanted to, uh, I mean, should I just say it? I'll just say it that yeah. um, this all started because I was interested in uh, Adolf Hitler and his taste in art and how his aesthetic taste influenced uh, his politics and influenced uh, the horrors of World War II. And tracing it all the way back, um, I had to figure out where modern art, abstract art came from. And uh, and I made the case in the previous episode, I believe, Chris, where I'm trying to I, I made the case that abstract art was didn't come naturally to humans. It didn't come naturally to us. And we didn't really abstract art didn't really exist before the 1900s. Uh, it was something that we had to uh, develop and come to. And it, it wasn't an easy road. And so the last episode was uh, The Road to Modernism, I called it. And we got up to this painting that you see on the screen, which is uh, Wassily Kandinsky's uh, 1903 The Blue Rider. Um, Now, we're not at modernism yet, but uh, The Road to Modernism really starts, I'll just recap it really quick. It starts in 1863 with The Salon des Refuses, which is, uh, um, it's like an alternative uh, alternative art scene. Uh, in Paris where people that aren't painting like the mainstream art can get some uh, views and get some eyeballs on their work and sell their work and then by 1874 you have uh, the term impressionism is coined and I made the argument previously that impressionism is really influenced highly by photography and I just want to make a point about that because you know a lot of people would say oh impressionism you know, and I, I thought the same thing, too, before I started studying this, but Impressionism is like some sort of, uh, it's the first step towards abstract art. It's the first step towards seeing in a different way that's not photorealistic. But, you know, that this, I, I don't think that's really the case if you look at the paintings. What you see is uh, is the camera's invented and photography starts to take uh, take off. And the Impressionists, I feel, are really influenced by photography. They're... they're, they're, they're uh, because what they want to do is they want to capture, uh, they want to capture a photorealistic scene of what they're seeing. They're, they want to capture, you know, they, they want to capture something that's um, correct, shall we say? Uh, and you know, this is a theme I think you see 
and we'll and you know I'll expand on this later. But this is a theme you see, I think, in the West, in um, the the let's say the Abrahamic world, Chris, like the Islamic, Christian, Judaistic, uh, uh, Jewish world. Uh, it's a theme where you see that people want the absolute truth. They want something that's correct, that's true. And you see that all throughout this world, in the Middle East and Europe. Uh, and so you see with the Impressionists, they're trying to capture reality in a much more correct fashion. Okay? And so and you see this in a lot of places, but especially, I think, in Europe. And, and so the Impressionists kind of open the door for, for seeing things in a different way. And I want to get to a moment, we'll get to it in this show, where the Europeans finally come up with abstraction. I mean, and you know, the Europeans are more wedded, I think, to to an absolutist way of seeing the world than anybody else in history. <laughs> but the, you know, and and you know, the the way of depicting um, figure to figures, the way of depicting people in a in a realistic fashion, it begins in this part of the world. You know, it begins in Egypt, I would say. And I don't have any. Um, I wish I had some slides to show you, but. The Egyptians really started uh, perfecting like a, a way of um, displaying the human form in statues that was that was more realistic than anybody had ever seen before. And by the time you get to the the Greeks and Romans, you know you see like an almost completely lifelike way of depicting the human form in statues. Um, okay, but going on from that, we get to 1903, and Wassily Kandinsky paints the Blue Rider. Hey, Chris. Can you yes. talk about the Blue Rider? I know you know a lot about this painting in Vasily uh, Kandinsky. Well, Vasily Kandinsky, uh, in his movement, and he is a uh, Russian. He is uh, their expressionist movement. Uh, people like Kokoschka, and in in Vienna, you're seeing around the turn of the century. Really, it's interesting because I is my, I think. Sometimes I think more about the Germany and Austria and less about Russia, but it is a very, uh, it's becoming in that period of time, a very big thing to deal not with reality as we see it, but reality as we feel it. Expressionism is felt reality. So uh, color theory starts to come into, I believe actually Kandinsky is one of the leaders of the color theory movement. Uh, it, it ascribes qualities and attributes to color that are more symbolic or metaphoric. And uh, it's very interesting if you who came of age in, we really understand film and we understand cinematography, but cinematography is very much in, influenced by people like Kent Vasily Kandinsky and the Blue Riders and the use of color for heightened tone. I mean, just take a look at this for just a moment and look at it. It's like almost like a comic book. There's like five colors, right? Brown, green, blue, a little white, a little pink, a little bit of goldish yellow. But it's very, it's very striking in that when you look at it, um, and this may not be the most reflective of the Blue Riders. I'm a big fan of some of the more the German ones who would follow after him, like Max Ernst, but it is really, it's not so much to say, hey, this is what something looks like, I'm reflecting reality back to you, but I'm like, this is what something feels like, I'm reflecting my way of looking at the world to induce an emotion. Right, it's, uh, you're trying to depict more of an internal state of mind rather than an absolutist, absolutely correct uh external view of the world and a highly subjective one at that well yes because an internal state of mind will always be subjective uh but um but yeah but it is I... also somewhat terrifying you know <laughs> to me it is somewhat terrifying and and it's i can't you're a european it. chris but but you know i mean <laughs> and i and i'm gonna just gonna be like from very pop arty for a second does this put you in the mind say of lord of the rings or star wars that you know what I'm so amazed that you re reference those things because I'm going to reference them later in a similar way. Um, but yes, it's like it's like uh, we are getting to a place in aesthetics, shall we say, where people are trying to express things that don't really exist, 
And that idea that you're going to express something that doesn't really exist physically um, is uh, it's mind blowing, Chris. Like like human beings could never do that. Before. And I will, I will, I will say that this is concurrent with the popularity of opera, which also deals with heightened emotional reality. Uh, the beginnings of people like Schoenberg and the twelve tonal system. So you have atonality. Uh, so in almost on many, and and even experimental theater like Ubel Roy, which comes out the same year as this. Uh, but uh, I can never remember the name of the French. Uh, playwright who wrote Ubu Roy. But my point is this beginning of the 20th century, uh, emotions are the revolt to logic and reason, to reality and beauty, the disharmony and chaos. Okay, so yeah, so this painting was highly influential. Um, it uh, Kandinsky was able to turn this painting into a movement and he started something called the Blue Rider Group, I believe it was called, and it was just a bunch of painters that wanted to try to experiment and uh inspired by this very painting inspired by this painting that's right okay so let's go on to the next one so this is uh matisse from 1904 and if you remember if you watch the last episode you'll see that it has like a lot of it has pointillist influence but you can see all the colors are off right chris so this is what you start to see as time goes on is getting away from the impressionists uh, people are starting to really um, uh, think about color and like just think about how uh, we don't need to accurately depict the real world. It's like exactly what you said, Chris. We're going to depict yeah. something that is subjective, that only exists internally. Um, we're going to make something new that doesn't even exist at all. Like these colors don't exist in reality. Actually, it's very funny too because I was thinking about the fact that this is the period where they start taking black and white photographs and making them into sepia tones and and infusing them with, you know, pink, gold, brown, colors yeah. that are somewhat surrealistic, but it gives at least a black and white photo a different palette. You know, you, and know you what, can see the Sorot pointillists in here as well. You know what, Chris, I never thought about that, but that makes total sense. It's like uh uh the artists of this time are influenced by the technological developments for sure, but it's like, so, you know, some of these feel so accidental. I mean, yeah, uh, if you look at photographs from this period, you can definitely see, like, the colors, they seem kind of random, <laughs> but it works somehow, right? I mean, and it, I mean, Matisse is a very, he's a educated painter, and if you are just going to be, if you look at the horizon points and you look at, it's almost like a, an L-shaped going from the foreground to the background, you know, the the composition is technically perfect. You know, the way the placement of bodies, the island, the water, it's all very precise. But what he does with it, within that, with the choices you say, the colors, the pointless approach, the anatomy that is somewhat more amorphous, uh, shows that he could, it's well within his power for him to recreate something that would be very much like photorealism if that was what he wanted. Well, all these painters can, you know, this is a point that like when people talk about the arts, they always want to tell like the novices, you know, that, oh, all these painters can paint photorealistically, but they just choose not to. Um, but, you know, there's a there's a deeper point to be made because they they are choosing not to because they are trying to get somewhere. I think they're trying to get to a different place uh, with aesthetics uh, than merely representing the natural world. Um, here, let's go on. Uh, so this is, so this is what I was talking about just a second ago. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, this is from 1905 from the water's edge. Um, so this is, uh, I think this is the same painter Matisse again. Wait, is it? Maybe not. Um, no, but this is from the same era. Okay. And you can see how it almost looks like a photograph, right? Yeah, Bill and the so Web. I just, I just want people to understand that, like, you know, a lot of these paintings that I'm bringing up that we're talking about in, in all these shows, they're they're on the cutting edge. They're not, like, the popular paintings of the moment, you know? So, like, a painting like this would probably... Is a photograph by our standards today. I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, if I even said, hey, here's a shot I just took by the lake house, it, you might actually believe that that is a photo I took by the lake house on my iPhone. There's, you know, look at the water and look at the right. light. I mean, right. it is a very 
very accurate representation of reality. Well, this is the kind of thing that would uh, would be selling then. Okay, so now let's go now. 19- I actually really like it. I think it's wonderful. To oh, be it's honest. beautiful. Uh, so this is 1906. Um, now in 1906, the term uh, Falvist, or no, yes. the term post-impressionism is coined. Actually, the year before, Falvist is coined. Now the Falvist is like French for wild beasts and. <laughs> Critics, you know, all these terms are made up by critics, and the critics called the Falvis wild beast because they just stopped caring about col- accurate colors. Okay, but but I want you to under I want you to um, notice though that even though they don't care about accurate colors anymore, they're still trying to make figurative art. They're still trying to depict something that exists in the actual world, even though they're not depicting it accurately anymore. They don't care about that. Well, I mean, even though there's an absence of figures, the Falvis. Is this another Matisse? This is, uh, I think it's De- Deranged. Andre Deranged. Okay. Well, then again, but you can see, again, the, the depictions are, it, it, when we were looking at Monet from 30, yeah, about 25 years ago, it's not a giant leap. You know, again, there's the fog, there's the water, there is the amorphous distance foreground with only certain particulars like the ships and the bridges highlighted again in simple brushstroke. All right. So this is another 1906 portrait of Madame Matisse. This is Matisse painting his wife, I believe. Yes. Madame Matisse. And you can see the colors are not very accurate. This is, this is all the Falvis started doing this. You know, they, they, uh, uh, Picasso of course is very famous for this kind of thing, you know, is where you, uh, the co- you just don't care about accurate colors anymore. No, the shade of green that divides her face from left to right. But you can see it's still figurative. It's still oh, depicting yeah. uh, something that exists in the real world. I mean, he's he's literally painting a portrait. The face is symmetrical. It's a or has a symmetricality of a real face. The neck has the real. The eyes look somewhat real. The ears. Everything about it is within the realm of, of proportionality to a degree. Okay, so this is uh, another 1906. Uh, uh, this is a portrait. I think it's uh, Robert de Lunay, a uh, portrait of another artist, uh, de Metz- Metzinger. And you can see, you can see the uh, the pointillist influence, and you can see how the points are getting huge, right? It's like it almost looks like yeah. tiles now. Um, and the colors. Yeah, it does look like accurate. a mosaic. Yeah. Yes. Um, but you can see the Falvis, or all these artists are, are there's, they're highly experimental this time, but still. They're not abstract yet. They're not completely abstract. They're still painting figures. This is another one. You can see it's a another Robert de Lunay, uh, similar style. Uh, this okay. So this is uh, this is a Picasso, right, Chris? This is uh, Le Demoiselle de Avignon, um, and you can see he's influenced. I think we talked about last episode. He's influenced by the. Um, is 1907. He's influenced by yeah. uh, the African art. The and you can see the different faces on each of these women. He's experimenting. He's he's giving. He's 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 looking. He's experimenting with different ways of seeing and depicting the human figure, in in um in this painting. And you can see he's got like four different ways of depicting the human face in here. Yeah. And, but he's still trying to depict human figures. Um, 1908. So this is uh, another one by Kandinsky. Okay, so Kandinsky is further. Exp- he's he's got further experiments going on. This is Blue Mountain, and he is. Uh... Yes. Did you want to say something, Chris? I just realized that people are listening to this. I need to be uh, better. If you've been listening and you're going, <laughs> I think I'm going to turn this off unless I actually. So, and we should have said this at the upfront. Um, Randall, we'll have a, a gallery that you can go to, I guess. You can download the slides on the website if you want, or you can watch the video on YouTube or Facebook. Okay, and I will, I promise, if you've already been with us this long, I will do my best to describe what we're looking at. That is on me. Uh, what we are looking at right now could be uh, described as uh, people on horses, and in the background there is this somewhat surreal uh, shape of a mountain in blue, and trees in uh, yellow and and cranberry with a pomegranate sky. It's very similar to what Peter Mack's art would look like in the 1960s if you 
saw the Beatles uh, animated film, uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts, The Yellow Submarine, it would be very reminiscent of that. And you can see that uh, the colors are not nearly accurate, It's uh, but it's still figurative. There's a yes. mountain, there's trees, there's horses. So this is uh, another Kandinsky, 1908. He's still experimenting. You can... And this is a small town. We like a main street. We can see buildings and uh, the background. There's a field and people in the foreground sitting on the grass, uh, picnicking possibly, some people walking, uh, maybe home from work, uh, a horse and carriage. Uh, but the colors are you know, yellowish green and orange and reddish hued apartment buildings or office buildings. Uh, the grass is green, but in a very, um, even some of the buildings are green, so it's somewhat hard to tell what's a building and what's grass. And then the sky is this very nice kind of yellowish rust quality. Everything again has a, it uh, has, has a heightened sense of, of color and surrealism or not surrealism, but it's, a, it's almost, colored i'd say i just want to point out too that at this time you know there's all these um art journals like the blue rider uh group they had their own journal and so all these artists are making these paintings and they're sharing them with the world and other artists through these journals so everybody's looking at everybody's art and they're all trying to come up with something and you can see like so the salon de refuses happened in uh 1863 which opened the door for experimentation but here we are in 1908, and we're still not at, at abstraction, okay? So this is my point, um, my overall point, that um, it's very difficult to get to abstraction. So this is, uh, this is arguably 1909, Francis Picabia. Uh, this is called Caudachuk, uh, I think it's called, which is uh, just rubber plants, I believe. Chris, so this, for those of you who are not looking, it's a series of intertwined circles in a background that is also made up of geometric shapes that could be parts of a circle. Uh, the circles are black striped, but everything else in the background is these blocks of gold, of goldish brown, black and rust and blue and gray and white. Um, this is truly a track. So <laughs> there is a center point and you can focus, as you say, on the rubber plant, if that is what it is. Well, uh, okay. I, uh, if you see a photograph of a rubber plant, it basically looks like uh, there's a bunch of fruit in the middle that, that looks like these uh, the circle he's, he's drawn and a bunch of leaves around it. So um, if you see a photo, you can see that uh, uh, this could be representational of a rubber plant. But yes, it, it does seem like it's getting away from figures. Um, but here's the interesting thing about this. Okay, and I've made this point many times before, like going all the way back to the landscape artists, is that these artists accidentally make abstract works all the time, but without the underlying philosophy be, to undergird it, without the philosophy to, to help them, to, to guide them, they, they don't recognize it. So if you look at Picabia's other works from this era, they're not even nearly this uh, uh, unrepresentational. They're not nearly this abstract. And I think Pacavia's wife came out in an interview and said, no, that was representational. <laughs> because uh, Kandinsky, you know, is going to go on to defend his reputation. We're not there yet, but he's going to paint the first abstract. Um, and and no one really challenged him. But yeah, uh, so this, so again, this is like the abstract, uh, this is like the uh, landscape painters where they, they accidentally paint abstracts, but they don't realize it. Okay, let's go on. So this is 1909. No, I like this. This is a Mondrian, uh, and you know Mondrian, right, Chris? Yes, Petit Mondrian. So he he is going to become famous for painting abstracts. Now, for those of you who are just listening, it's a series of horizontal brush strokes. If you look too closely, that's all you'll see. But if you take a moment to look at the composition of yellow, green, blues, and whites, it is what does it say dunes from the beach yeah, this is called view from the dunes with beach and piers and it does look like a beach it does look like waves it does look like waves splashing on the sand but you do have to step back i do have a feeling that if we were in a gallery and we saw this actual painting and stood about six feet away the uh that is when it would truly all of these diverse lines 
and color stripes would, would start to coalesce into a, a much more easy to comprehend picture. Yeah, so uh, it's still representational. Um, they still, no one has still thought, oh, I'm going to paint something that doesn't exist. I mean, it still just hasn't happened yet. Um, but you can see they're getting close. So this one is another Kandinsky, 1909. Okay, okay. these are, uh, this is called Train at Le Chateau. So this is a train. It's The train is in black. It is on a track, which is somewhat green and gold. The background is uh, looks like a small country town with some grass and fields uh some houses in the background some clouds that it's possibly night given how much black there is and again much like the blue rider this is very expressionistic you can feel instead of the blue now it, it's really the contrast of the dark train dark clouds dark shadow against these very bright greens yellows and reds and I want to point something out. It's been six years since the Blue Rider, since Kandinsky painted the Blue Rider, and it's taken him that long to get to this point. Okay, and you can still see it's representation. I like that purple stripe that somehow bisects the field with the train. And that actually is quite jarring, if only because it's the only purple in the entire painting, and it's very hard to know what it's supposed to represent. Yeah, interestingly, you can see the, you know, when I was talking about the landscape painters, you can see it's like there's a, uh, the sky, the 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 landscape is uh, it's 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 dropping into abstraction just like they used to do. Like what is that? Can you put your pointer on the purple line? For the purple, purple yes. Is that a lake? Is that a stream? <laughs> is that what is that? It's definitely not emanating from the train because we can see where smoke is coming out of the train, and it, and there's no it, it's connected to an orange thing that we do see some orange or field, but that's just kind of like. I believe it might be a lake or a stream. But yeah, to it choose it, but not to use blue, but to use purple, and only purple in that one point forces your eye to the point of the painting. Not the any other. There's a lot of things going on in this painting that your eye should fall back there and not out in front by the house or the front of the train or the light or anything else. Really, also shows you. It, yeah, I have no answer for that question. If someone does, please uh, write a comment. I, this is beyond my abilities. All right, let's go on. So let's see. Okay, so this is 1910. This is another Kandinsky. Black um, and white people. This is, what is this one called? Indian View? I think this is just composition one. This is like something it's, he uh, just painted like I think it's, it might be a watercolor, something he painted not to be a serious painting. Just a bunch of people st in collision with other people. It's it's well, you can actually see, quite nice. You can see we're seven years out, and this is a black and white. I think I think you this see is, like feet and arms, and then full compass. It's it's certainly the most figurative thing we've seen. I think this is lost this painting, but we have a black and white. A photo of it um so the, so you can see it's like we're seven years out from his blue rider and he's still he's still figurative uh let's go on let's see and by the way we're in 1910 now and the term cubis cubism has been coined by another critic because he looked at uh some paintings and it looked like uh the paintings kind of looked like they were made up of little tiny cubes so he <laughs> he called it cubism um okay let's go on Okay, so is Egon Schiel? Egon Schiele. Schiele. And um, self-portrait, 1910. What do you Maybe see, Chris? Schiel. I, you know what, folks? We're not good at German. So <laughs> I believe it's Egon Schell. Um, but it could be Schell. Um, I'm a big fan of him. He is, you know, he, he's coming up around the same time as Kokoschka. And uh, he uses real models. But then after that, I mean, it, it is uh, disturbing. It is a naked man with who's very skinny, whose arms are larger. His hand is larger than uh, his his torso. Uh, his face is twisted in a certain kind of. It's hard to even say. It, it's uh, yeah, it's it's very repulsive, <laughs> and I mean that as a compliment. Very limited use of color. Very, you know, it's a, it's just a kind of a pale yellowish background, a cream background, with little highlights of white, 
and then just a pink body just really Isn't something it? is wrapped around his arm and i can't even tell if it's clothing or more flesh isn't it interesting, though, that it's still figurative, and it seems like painters of this time, they're coming up with all these different ways to represent reality. But yes. none of them have thought about going abstract yet. I mean, even Kandinsky. Okay, so this is this is a good example of Cubism. It's Pablo Picasso, 1910, Girl with a Mandolin. That's a very famous piece by Picasso for the Cubist time. Um, and again, it is, on one hand, a series of ge geometric shapes, and on the other hand, it is the figure of a woman playing a mandolin. And the Cubists, you know, I would argue that the Cubists get really close to abstraction, maybe even going over the line to abstraction. And that's why they got such a weird reception in some parts of the world, especially the United States. Uh, but, you know, they they weren't even trying to go to full abstraction. Um, I don't think. So this, okay, so now we finally get to what is possibly the first abstract painting of all time, Chris, in 1910. Okay, Vasily Kandinsky's watercolor. And this does look like a series of abstract illustrations of, of objects. He's using blue, red, green, but all against a white background with no particular sense of composition or space. Things are just kind of splattered in 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 no particular manner so this this is a watercolor and i think that kandinsky later uses this to prove he painted the first abstract uh i don't think because it's a watercolor you know i don't think this is a very serious work at the time uh and there's another work he makes the next year that becomes yeah, i will say this about watercolors because my mom's a painter mm -hmm. and she has always told me that watercolor is a very unforgiving <laughs> medium and and i do want to point out that there is nothing that looks like it's by accident in this painting. Every choice of color and the tightness of whatever it is that he's creating is very specific. I could compare this to, to, to maybe a bouquet of flowers, which would not be correct since those are more compact, but whatever he is doing in this, in this particular painting, it, it is clearly not by accident. It's not like a free association. Right. And, and, you know, but yeah, so he finally makes a painting. A European artist has finally made a painting. An artist has finally made a painting that's of nothing. There is nothing in this painting that is in the real world. This is not depicting anything that exists. This, that is, correct. this is, this is a, a piece of art that only exists within itself. This, okay. I mean, I, this is a groundbreaking moment in the history of the arts, Chris. This is this is the abstract moment. This is now again for those of you who think we're making too much out of something. <laughs> I do really want to point out that for th millenniums, millenniums, the role of art was just to replicate reality. That was it. The role of art was simply to capture for posterity something that we all see but cannot hold. So our memories are only so good, but a painting, a depiction, a carving on a cave to a stretched canvas, anything between that period of history simply exists to show you what you already know, but can refer back to just so you know that you're not alone in seeing it. My point is this, and, I, and it, just at the most important point, folks, <laughs> imagine we, we take so much for granted because we live in a postmodern era. But this was the most important thing. This really was insane that people up and literally from when are the cave paintings, Randall? Well, cave paintings go back uh, hundreds of thousands of years, I believe. Right. So that was when they were painting what tigers, animals, hunters. Yeah. And I've, I've looked at many, and I've made this point in other episodes, I've looked at many, many of these cave paintings. You don't see abstraction, I don't believe, Chris. No, no, because it, it was never the point of maybe doodling, but the point of creating real works of art up to this point, even what we've just seen right now, which is a filtered version of the world as we, you know, wor the world with distortion, the world with feedback. But this is just a pure product of the mind with no apology. And that human beings should go from 
the dawn of civilization to 1910, 112 years ago, just going, okay, let me show you what a building looks like in its most precise form. Let me show you how I imagine a tree to be to, I don't know, man, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do with color and shape and just see what it looks like. That, you know, we today, all of us who came of age after 1910, you know, which would not be my grandparents, but my parents were the first generations to go, oh, when I make a, a work of art, I don't have to replicate the tree. I mean, even with children, right? The first art projects we do is to replicate reality. Yeah, so I remember this- as a child in class, Chris, uh, you know, every now and then in elementary school, we'd have drawing time. Yeah. The teacher would play music and just say, draw stuff. And yeah. I remember one day the teacher said, you can draw something abstract. And I was like, what's abstract? And she said, uh, it's nothing. It's just shapes and things. It's, it's, you're drawing nothing. And human beings at our inception, we just don't know how to do that. We always feel like when we draw, almost through collective memory, that it's our role to replicate reality as it is. Well, yeah, it's not obvious, the concept. And so what you're seeing here is the birth of the modern world, right, Chris? I mean, this is what I would argue. This yeah, is the, you are the modern world is born right here when Kandinsky paints this. Um, shall I go on? Please. I just This is the moment, folks. So two and a, <laughs> two and a half episodes have led up to this. I just don't, you know, in case you're wondering, and you know, it's what's a, your point? This is our point, folks, that it really was something as bizarre as one man 112 years ago going, huh, I don't have to do a tree. Or certainly don't have to do a tree that looks like a tree, that feels like a tree, that's my interpretation of a tree. Nah, I can just kind of do random stuff with watercolor, a very unforgiving medium. So please understand that each particular thing we're looking at took a lot of time and control to create. He didn't just whip this off randomly. This is several hours to several days to possibly several months Well, it took him really hard work. It took him years from uh, the Blue Rider painting. It took him uh, well, just a singular seven composition, years. That's what I'm saying. This composition was not dashed off in five minutes. It may look by our modern sensibilities because it fails to replicate reality as something you could just do, but I would dare anyone to work in watercolors and try to produce anything where each particular object has a such particular definition and shape. And even though you may think there's no composition, there is distance and positioning between every single thing. There's a, there's a lot of thought that went into this, but how do you put a lot of thought and detail into depicting something with no reference point? This is the first time that we really see art made with no reference points. Yeah, and I just want to point out too that, so this is 1910. The Salon des Refuses took place in 1863. So it basically took the European artists uh, 48 years to get to this point. (laughs) Or humanity, what, 10,000 years. Yeah, it took humanity many thousands of years. But for the European artists who have a whole industry of art, they're selling art, they're making art, uh, alternative art is is started in 1863, and it takes them 48 years to figure out how to do this, to do this at all. I mean, th- this is how difficult it is to get to this moment. So now that we've opened the door, we've had the abstract moment, I just yeah. want to show the audience now. We're going to end this show by showing the audience what it opens, how what happens now. Now that modernism uh, has, has been born. Boom. So, so boom. So this is... This is another Kandinsky in 1910, and you can see that he's still he still goes back to figurative. I mean, he's not exactly. This is like a factory um, with weird colors. But let's go on. Um, so this is uh, composition five, Kandinsky, 1911, and I think this is the most famous abstract, uh, the first most famous abstract. Um, this is a oil painting. This is the first one that really. Uh, that really gets a lot of people's attention, that really gets famous. Um, so you, you, do you want to say anything about this one, Chris? Uh, okay, folks, those of you who are listening, this is so abstract that I cannot even <laughs> describe it, so I apologize. It represents nothing. There's nothing represented. It's, it is, it's geometry, it's shape, it's color, it's line. Uh, it's possible there are hidden things in it, but it's also just as possible that that's the 
mind searching to make order out of nothing. Uh, yeah, I it, it this is this is abstract art, pure and simple. All right, let's go on. So this is another Kandinsky of 1911. This is uh, called Picture with a Circle. And you can see he's starting to play around with uh, geometric shapes. I mean, there are circles with some dots. I mean, it's not... I mean, a child might say that's a face. <laughs> a child might say, you know, what we're looking at is a couple of faces. But it's, to me, just circles, lines, and colors. Uh, and that's the best way to describe it for those of you who are listening. Circles, lines, and colors. Okay, let's go on. So this is... Uh, ah, this there's is... your buddy, Marcel Duchamp. <laughs> we talked about this in an earlier staircase. episode. Yeah, we talked about this in an earlier episode. Duchamp, New Descending a Staircase, 1912. This painting became famous in America because it was at the Armory Show, which was Okay, the first so if time. you're listening, I'm just going to tell you right now. Hit pause. <laughs> go to Google. Type in N-U-N-D. Descending a staircase, nude descending a staircase. I know what you're going to see some crazy stuff, so you might want to also write add the word in Duchamp. How do you spell Duchamp? Uh, uh, D U C H A M P, like it sounds. Okay, because otherwise you might get a lot of Pornhub stuff. <laughs> uh, but this is, and it really this is this is motion and movement. This is figurative. If you, you could make the argument because it does capture something from our reality, but it transposes it in such a very surreal, unnatural way that you, you're you really looking at two different things at once. Yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, Duchamp got a lot of uh, uh, criticism for this painting, and he's a little bit behind the curve because already uh, Kandinsky is painting abstracts and Duchamp is still trying to depict motion and different ways of seeing in a painting. Um, he's still figurative, but you know, Duchamp, he, he, uh, he goes far beyond uh, uh, Kandinsky eventually. So to like a lot of artists, um, let's go on. Let's uh, so this is um, 1912. This is uh, Francis Kupka. And you can see this is a completely abstract. Francis Your guess is as good as mine. Again, it's <laughs> it's geographic, geometrical shapes, somewhat more oval related. Almost reminds me of what I would make with a. Oh, I know I can't remember what it was called, but yes, it's it's some blues and reds, some whites and black. It's like an etcher sketch almost. Um, you know it is I'm... ornamental, in some sense, because of the. Uh, shaping between the reds and the blues is very illustrative same with the black and the whites there is again if you really think about how this was composed they probably put tape over stuff so that you could paint the blue and then you have space to make the red and same with the white and black there's a lot of thought that goes into this um it is deliberative and yet at the same time there is no rhyme or reason to it and you know what else happens in 1912, Chris? World Outside War. Oh, sorry. Uh, a Princess of Mars, written by Edgar Rice Burroughs, it starts to be published in All Story Magazine. Oh wow! Do you know? Do you, are you familiar with that work? Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter, Warlord Lord of Mars. Yes. So, Daja Thoris is her name. <laughs> so. Uh, the Barsoom series, right? Because what is it? Yes. Barsoom is Mars in these books. So this is the prototype uh, for like movies like Star Wars and other science fiction, you know, Buck Rogers and stuff. Um, really? I was going to say this looks like every Algebra 2 book I had in high school. <laughs> or Geometry or Trig, you know. No, no, like... I'm talking – not about the painting, Chris. I'm talking, oh, I'm sorry. Is, I'm talking about – this is another Picabia. Oh, I'm talking about um, – I'm just talking about a Princess of Mars, the Barsoom series. So right. in literature, you know, uh, because it's, uh, you know, modern science fiction, you know, is another part of the modern world that doesn't exist. We are like, looking at a couple who are naked, who are embracing each other. But at the same time, they're just made out of geometrical blocks. Everything is in flesh tone for the body. And their background is more of a goldish brown. And they could well be on the moon. So yeah, you can see you. that Picabia is like uh, he's still kind of figurative even in 1912. I mean, this is all this is a year, at least a year after, or the same year that. Um, but how does this relate to John Carter, Warlord of Mars? It doesn't. 
It doesn't, but I just wanted to point out that this is what's happening in the arts. Okay, um, no, no, so it's cool. Have... I, I know. I actually think you are right because in this period in theater and music, again, uh, artists all over are taking liberties. In uh, Gaston of Alapenere is reading his manifesto at this point. You know, artists feel that they that how far can they take the known world and transpose it into a world of science, shape, geometry, or wherever their imagination takes them. And it, it, it's very freeing and very liberating to see. Right, and this is what happens after the abstract moment. So you see this explosion in the arts where they're trying to imagine like completely new worlds. I mean, um, the Barsoom series, Mars, I mean, even though it's Mars, it's like a, it, it's a completely uh, fantastic world that could never exist. Um, and you know, H.G. Wells, H.G. Wells was alive and writing at this period in history. Right. H.G. Wells comes before abstraction. But, you know, if you read like science fiction of the H.G. Wells time, you know, he is writing about something. Right. He's writing science yeah. fiction that is a commentary on our world somehow. But when you get to like the Barsoom series, Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, it's just a escapist fantasy. I mean, it's like it's completely unconnected from our world at that point. This is a 1912 uh, Robert Delaunay. Um, I think it's called Simul Simultaneous Windows on the City. <laughs> and again, geometrical colored shapes, uh, but it is like a frame. It looks a lot like a painting frame. Well, let's go um, on. So this yes. is another Kandinsky, 1912. You can see he is expanding. I mean, you can see that this painting almost, you almost see things that look like figures. It could be a wolf or an animal but they meld into complete abstraction. He's, he's toying with us now, Chris. He is. And this is, you know, again, now, again, if you can't see, if you're listening, it is just, again, a series of abstract shapes and colors. There's like a reddish bull. So here's another, this is 1913, uh, Morgan Russell, uh, Cosmic Synchrony. And you're starting to notice that the rainbow colors, so certain colors are becoming far more prominent, reds, rusts, greens. These are really, uh, for lack of a better word, ugly colors. And I don't mean that as a put down. I mean that, you know, you're starting to see colors that are not pretty. You're starting to see very vibrant colors or very dark colors. And the contrast between these colors are not what you'd call traditional color contrast. Uh, but they, again, much like the Blue Riders, they create a tone and a feeling and a mood and not a very pleasant one. Well, you got to think, too, what are the abstractions trying to do? They're trying to create a universe, a world that exists only within the painting. Yes. And it, so every color has to mean something intrinsically. Shapes have to mean something intrinsically, you know, and all these painters are coming up with different systems for that. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's it's like a... It's, and it's they're nothing using that the, ever happened before. They're the using the play words of science. Synchronicity is, is a science term. And if you even know anything about the classical music of this period, it has like a studies or, a, a, you know, symphony. And, like they're even The terms for music being composed, the terms for poetry being composed, everything is becoming, a, this is a period where every kind of science, pseudo-scientific principle is being applied to the arts because somehow there's a feeling that it can be quantifiable. It can become uh, a political. Uh, this is a very big time of political upheaval in the world, in Europe at this period in history. Well, you know, I think well, this is an so interesting point. Art you're is going hand in hand with that. Yeah, I think this is an interesting point you're making because there's a lot of other things that are going on right now that signal the end of uh, the European uh, mindset, I would say. It's like, so what's happening is. Um, this idea that there's an absolute truth is like starting to chip away, you know, and you have, and we'll talk about this in the next episode more, but you have like these different uh, groups founded that are, that are searching for like um, some deeper truth to the universe, such as theosophy, theosophy society. Um, Einstein has come up with this theory of relativity, you know, um, uh, his other paper E equals MC squared, you know, where the idea that, uh, that things are quantifiable and absolute and unchanging. The, those I, that idea is starting to fall away. I mean, even the idea that uh, of the existence of God and uh, 
the absolute goodness of uh, of whatever. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is uh this is the same. We already saw this. This is from right. Sometimes uh, people attribute this to 1913. He's he he wrote 1910 on it. So I don't know if that's a. I don't know if Kandinsky is like uh, trying to claim that. I don't know if that he's lying, but well, so that's a textualist work you now have in front of us. This is Malevich, nineteen fifteen, and so Malevich for a while was. Uh, some people claim that he was the first abstract artist, but you can see like he's he's going into complete abstraction, yeah, and he's he's playing with the um the the uh, the surface of the canvas, right? Yeah. Let's go on to okay. So this is another Malevich. I like Malevich because he. He is he is experimenting with things that uh, um, Kandinsky doesn't like. He's and again, more... you're seeing just shapes in in space. For those of you who are listening, geometric blocks. Uh, Madrian also around this time is also doing a work like this. This is actually what we're looking at right now is far more indicative of where abstractionism is going at this point in history, which is a uh, separation color uh yeah i'm sorry i mean to take so much time on it yeah and you can see like how other artists are starting to really get influenced by kandinsky and going beyond kandinsky another thing that's happened now is 1914 world war one has started and i just want to point out world war one you know uh world war one starts as a traditional war like uh the kind of war that um humans have had for thousands of years where you have two armies line up and then they're going to start fighting each other, right? <laughs> well, the, it was referred to as the Great War, the war to they, end all wars. And right, but they, it's considered a turning point. It's the end of a certain kind of 19th century aristotic, aristocratic view of the world. That is the end right. of, 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 of idealism, romanticism, uh, classism, and, and, and a certain naivete and – Exactly. And so, and it's also the failure of science, you could argue, or the the mechanism, arm, the arming of science. So, the well, weaponization we, of science. So, this is going to make a humongous shift in the world of of art. This will change art well, profoundly. Right, because of the machine gun and other killing technologies, uh, it's quickly discovered that uh, you can't fight wars the way you used to fight them. <laughs> You have mustard and, gas, you have trench war, uh, men getting slaughtered in infantry thanks to the machine gun. Right. Okay, let's go on to – okay, so this is another great Malevich, 1915. It's basically just a black circle on a white canvas, right? Could not describe it better. <laughs> and what's great is the circle is not in the middle, all right? It's like off to the corner. All right, let's go on. So here's another Malevich. It's like – a square within a square. It's and the square. The square within the square is not very centered. Um, okay, now here is a 1921 uh, monument to the March dead. Uh, I'm not sure who made this one. This is uh, it. It it is uh, it is something you would never seen before the abstract moment. I would argue. This it's interesting too because if you look at contemporary monuments, go look at like the one for the World Trade Center. Or anything, they tend to follow along the footsteps. Now, all the 20th century up to today, when we do monuments, tend to be abstract. Whereas, if you look at monuments right up through World War One, they're often, you know, Greek influence, classical influence, the statues, but they're very, very traditional. This, this is just what we're looking at here. Is I believe it poured concrete of some sort with it could be almost a lightning bolt. And maybe a pyramid, some triangles, but it, it, it's completely devoid of any particular point of view. Yeah, and you know, um, there is a, there's a certain feeling you get when you look at works that are quote unquote modernist, right, Chris? It's like they seem different than than the things that came before. There, there's it's like there's the abstract moment is like this 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 boundary, this dividing line, this wall. You can only see when modernism begins because when you look at that, there's no soldier <laughs> standing there, you know, or there's no Lady Liberty. There are no people to inform you what you're observing. You actually don't know from the distance what this commemorates because 
because whatever this means to the artist is lost upon the viewer. And I don't mean that as a put down. I just mean that the artist didn't feel a need to 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 communicate that to the viewer. But it, it but would you agree with me, Chris? And the dividing line is stark between oh, yeah. the, the ancient world and the modern world. And world right War there. One really is it splits it in half and it never repairs. Okay, let's go on. So this is Ah uh, Madrian. <laughs> Sieur Le Pete Le Maison. Ah. Can you imagine beautiful like beautiful work? Beautiful work. Yeah, this is 1921. Mondrian. Chris loves this stuff. Um, can you imagine if Mondrian had lived like I don't know, like in 1000 and painted this? I mean, <laughs> look for those of you who are just listening. It's just a series of squares and rectangles, most of which are in black and white. One. Rectangles yellow, one rectangles blue, and one rectangle is end. And honestly, what this is is just the beauty of composition, color choice. This is, this is what I mean by uh, abstractionism is deceptively simple, but you could put the colors in different places. You could make the shapes different shapes, but it's a just the the brilliance of trying to just take simple configurations and figuring what is the most pleasing way of of assembling it. That is arresting and developing. That's that's a genius. And okay, and a couple of years before this, in 1919, uh, the Bauhaus is founded in Germany by Walter Gropius, who's an architect. Uh, Bauhaus is uh, German for building house, and it was an art school. And it it ran until 1933. There until is a not- great book about that called uh, Bau- "From Our House to Bauhaus." Uh, we can put a link on it because I cannot remember the name of the author. It might have been Tom Wolf, but I might be wrong. But if you want to learn more about how Bauhaus has influenced us, that is the book to read. Yeah, and you know, we're about. I'm about to show you some slides from from Bauhaus designers, and they were trying to redesign everyday objects. And you will see that they pretty much create the modern world, the the world as we envision it today, and. And guess who hated these these people, Chris? Oh, Hitler, of course. Hitler and the Nazis, and <laughs> and I'm gonna about to, I'm about to show you some slides. Hold on, but just I want to give you the name of the author in case you're just listening. It is uh, from Bauhaus to Our House by Thomas Wolfe, the same man who wrote the right stuff in Bonfire of the Vanities. So that is uh, T O M new word W O L F E. Uh, he is not really an art critic. He is really an essayist and an observer. And you do not need to know anything about art. You can know less than we do easily or more than we do. And you will find it to be just a very entertaining and informative observation on what we're covering today. And guess who – well, the Bauhaus, uh, Walter Gropius, who founds it, he he, he... – taps the shoulders of a lot of artists to come in and contribute guess who one of them is is uh our favorite kandinsky who invents abstract painting um okay so let's go on so look what do you see here chris i see an ikea lamp (laughs) if you yeah if you look at this today you'd say oh that's just a lamp but back then this was revolutionary to make a lamp that looked like this i mean this is where industrial design contemporary industrial design begins is 1922, yeah. So this is a commonplace lamp to us today. It's just but... an office lamp in black with a little bit of gold trim. Right. And this is uh, ah, this, this is from 1923. This is a cover of, I think, a Bauhaus uh, catalog, perhaps. Yes. Um, but you, but what, the what... font is uh, great in this. There are. Uh, this is a Bauhaus font. You have this font on your. You guys, you can reproduce this font on your Microsoft Word like this moment, and this is where the font was born. The shape was born. But look, look at the the lines and the and the the word. The, I mean the the font. I mean the thing is, is if there's you look, a face in there if you look carefully. <laughs> yes, if you looked at catalog cover covers of magazines and books before then, you would see like the the nice illustrations and you know was, everything was representational. This is like almost totally abstract. Right. It is. It's very clever. If you grew up in the 80s, you know, these the style from like some of your record albums, because there was a great revival of this style in the 80s. It's uh, just wonderful what's red and black and the lines can do. And, you know, I'll say something else interesting about this modern Bauhaus style is that um, 
it almost has destroyed the traditional styles, right? I mean, after after the Bauhaus, how can anyone go backwards and make like a Victorian era cover, right? And Nobody we does. will do an entire episode on Bauhaus, I promise. So forgive us if we just go too quickly, but okay, this Ooh. is uh, this is uh, some uh, kids' toy blocks designed d- designed by a Bauhaus designer, nineteen twenty four. Um, available at Target. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you look at something like this today. I mean, this looks like something you could go to the store and buy, right? Can Air Play School. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Let's go on. Um, okay. So this is the exterior of the Bauhaus School. Now, I just, I, just, I mean, my my opinion is, I look at this, and they design. You know, this was specifically designed by them. My opinion is, I look at this and I see how modern buildings look right the the the, the facade is yes. almost entirely glass they're very clean lines there's no this is the beginning of really i mean this is a field of architecture it gets a little confusing but yes this kind of clean industrial architecture really for the most part gets its start here in the bauhaus movement and you can see that even the word i mean words become art too the the sign the bauhaus has been made into a gigantic uh, font of uh, and it's letters. A ge- Notice how geometrically perfect each line, you know, the A matches the shape of the B, the U to the H, you know, everything is very, very precise as far as width. There is no, no word really occupies more space than the other word. Okay, let's go on. So this is <laughs> Barcelona. Uh, that's a Barcelona chair from the uh, Barcelona World's Fair. Uh I forgot the famous designer of the Barcelona chair. Is oh, it Brewer? Um, Brewer, yes. And again, you can get this at Design Within Reach. These were designed in 1925, but I'm sure that most people that would see this would say, oh, those are like... Your parents own this chair. I'm serious. Go ask them. You they know, would say... in the attic. But you could, you, would see, you could see furniture like this anywhere today. This is commonplace furniture today, wouldn't you? Hey, go to Ikea. I'm serious. Ikea has this in three different colors. Uh, you can do this. The same with that that lovely desk. That is all available today at IKEA. All right, let's go on. Um, this is uh, a 1925 Bauhaus chair. Yep. It looks kind of uncomfortable, actually. Maybe it's a step stool. I, I think know. it's a step stool. Okay, let's go on. Here is another Bauhaus cover. You can see how modern it looks. I mean, even though this is hand illustrated, it almost. <laughs> It almost looks like uh, it was generated by a computer, right? Somebody sat yeah. down and made it in Photoshop or something. This is 1925. Uh, yeah. th- oh, actually, this is um, – let's see. Oh, this is actually a blueprint for a stage, I think. Yes, Maybe they did a lot of stage design. Okay, let's go on. Uh, okay, what do you see here? This is 1931. This is, uh, this is a this clock. Is a cl- clock. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It, it looks modern, doesn't it, Chris? It looks like something out of our world. I would say if you look at the album by New Order, uh, if you Google it, it's just called New Order, FACD.50, 1981 Movement. Uh, I could show you, but I don't think it would look good here. You'll just see how like Bauhaus style once again came back in the 80s. Okay, this is... Uh... Ovaletti typewriter. Yes, so... Is this art, Randall? <laughs> yes, well... Industrial design, folks, is art. Go to museums and you will see, once you get to the 20th century, something as simple as a typewriter can be considered art. And Ovaletti is is certainly a lot of thought goes into design. And there's some wonderful documentaries about these things. Well, I think uh, I think that uh, brings us to the end, Chris. So what we've seen is the birth of the modern world that starts in 1911, shall we say, with Kandinsky's uh, painting. And I want to say uh, other things that have influenced. Okay, so you're talking about like, um, you know, the Bauhaus had a huge influence. But but in 1929, you have the Buck Rogers comic strip that comes out. You have uh, 1933, you have the first modern comic book is published, Famous Funnies. In 1937, The Hobbit comes out, and you know you go on, you extrapolate on and on. You have things like Star Wars are clearly influenced by uh, Flash Gordon and things. Flash Gordon was um, 
a competitor to Buck Rogers. Um, yeah. So he, so that's it, Chris, the birth of the modern world. And with the birth of the modern world, a redefinition of what is art, as because now we live in a world where industrial design is a form of art, architecture is considered a form of art, uh, non-figurative work is considered a form of art. And all of this really can be attributed on some level or another, Randall, as you pointed out, to the 19th century, to the rise of photography, to movements like impressionism, expressionism, emotional, uh, all the Favist movements, you know, all of these things basically trigger something else. And as art changes from literally millenniums of just being very, very much limited to what is in an academy, what is sculpted, what is on canvas to something that is just diffuse. And the limit is, I would argue, your imagination. And the what we consider imagination gets redefined uh, with the birth of the 20th century. Where this will lead us, Randall, I am fascinated to find <laughs> out. And I promise our, our listeners, now we're going to get personal and we're going to deal with people and consequences in the world of art. Until then, I'm Chris. I'm Randall. And we'll talk again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.